Thank you for tuning in to the best parenting show on the internet. Post Daily Dose. Hey, good evening, Facebook family, and welcome to another episode of Post Daily Dose with me, your trusted parenting advisor, faithful guide, and servant on the healing journey. What's my name? Big Papa, Brian Post. Namaste, parents. Happy Manic Monday. True confession. Before I jump, jump into today's topic, which is parenting teens through trauma true confession i miss you guys on happy freaking fabulous friday because guess what big papa was taking a siesta baby that's right i was taking a nap because in california it's 4 30 which is usually 6 30 central standard time so obviously it's evening there 7 30 in new york eastern standard time it's nighttime but here it's like middle of the afternoon and i love a good nap I love it. I love it. I love it. So Friday, (laughs) I woke up at five o'clock and I was like, oh man, I missed the daily dose. But that's all right. I don't beat myself up about that kind of stuff. And I hope you forgive me. I ask your forgiveness. And, uh, you know, I was, I I worked, I worked, (laughs) I worked hard last week. And in fact, uh, hey, Rose Baker. In fact, have you ever had that experience where you work on Saturdays and then you finally relax on Sunday, more or less? And I have, yeah, I did a little work yesterday, Sunday, a little, yeah, a little bit, not too much. And then on Mon- Monday comes around and you're like, dang, I wish today was Sunday. That was my experience this this morning. So I don't know. The Lord is just telling me this is the season of teenagers. I have seen more teenagers in the past week because I've been on the road this week. Starting starting on, what was it, Tuesday? Starting on Tuesday, um, almost everyone with the exception of a couple of families have been teenagers, which is fine. I love teenagers, actually. And there are a couple common themes that keep showing up. And I want to talk to you guys about common themes that show up in raising teenagers. And number one, and you should know that I make this stuff up on the fly. <laughs> so, oh, hey there, Mimi. I actually, I am, uh, I'm shooting in front of our rose garden because I wanted you to see this yellow rose. The yellow rose of, uh, where's my finger at? The yellow rose of Mimi, right there. See it? That's you, my Mimi, my yellow rose. So anyway, um, common common, uh, variables in raising teens, common themes in raising teens, common elements and common struggles in raising teens, number one. And this this is just like fresh because it's like every... So many families I've, I've seen just over the last week and a half, um, almost last full week, have been teenagers. And this is for adoptive parents, foster parents, biological parents. This is, you know, I put the topic is trauma, parenting teens through trauma, but it doesn't even have to regard trauma. Number one is that when your children hit the teenage years, you have to give them more control. You have to be willing, and this is so challenging. And the only reason, think about this, the only reason we seek to be in control is when we're stressed. When you seek to be in control, you're stressed, and the control, you know you're stressed because you're trying to control, because your amygdala sees a threat. And so then you want to try to control the situation. Why? Not because you're trying to teach your child, you know, the responsible path, which of course that's what you're doing, you know, as a parent, but in that moment, you're not trying to teach your son, your child anything. In that moment, you're trying to have control because of stress and fear. You want to have control so that you can help yourself feel better. 
And then what happens is you create this battle. You start creating this battle with your teenager over and over and over again. And pretty soon it becomes you against your teen. And when it becomes you against your teen, then actually it causes you to start losing relationship with your teen. Relationship allows you to influence. Relationship allows you to influence. A couple weeks back I had a mom text me. She said my daughter you know, went out the other night and I didn't want her to. She said she wasn't going to be gone long, but I still want her to stay home. What do I do when that kind of situation happens? And I said, the next time she gets ready to leave, give her a hug, say, I love you. I wish you would stay home, but I understand you feel like you need to go. Please don't be gone long, and I'll see you when you get back. And walk away. And mom said the next time it came up, she was gone for like three minutes and actually even took the dog with her and then came back home. So many, so much of the conflict we create with te our teenagers is because of our own fear. Now, that's giving the teen control. You got to be willing to relinquish, relinquish some, tr some control when it comes to raising your teens. Number two, you got to recognize your own adolescent trauma. So I was spending time with a mom and dad the other day and um they've been getting into this power this power dynamic with their teenage daughter and one of the first things I always do and I always tell you guys healing starts in the home and it starts with the parents healing happens in the home and it starts with the parents because I don't care how old your child is if they're your child and you're raising them and you're teaching them then you're literally changing their brain that is what we're doing when we're creating healing when we're creating behavior change any change comes from brain change keep that in mind that's why you can punish your children for a short period of time you can consequence them you can spank them you can do whatever you do in that short-term moment and what it does is it creates a chemical reaction and that's what changes the behavior for a short period of time is the chemical reaction repetition repetition through relationship is what literally leads to the formation of new pathways new synaptic connections in your child's brain that leads to true behavior change so you are literally changing your child's brain so one of the first things i ask parents is tell me about your history mom tells me about hers she tells me about the time when she's 12 years old her parents divorced and she has to raise her five-year-old brother and she has to raise him till she's you know 15 16 years old she's got an emotionally abusive and a verbally abusive stepdad and then she's you know trying to get a job and she's working so she essentially parentified and that was at 12, 16, she left home. And then dad starts telling his story at the age of 12. His, uh, his parents had gotten divorced. And then he bounced from home to home to home. I think he said something like he was in, in six, six to seven different homes, family members' homes, over just the course of like a, a one-year period of time. And, you know, it, it's I love working with dads because I find dads to be the the most sensitive some of the most sensitive um passionate individuals and, and it's like most of the time in our society we're really scared of dads and this dad he just started crying and he just was overwhelmed and i said are you okay and he's just telling the story and he said, I said, are you okay? And he's like, no. And then so we just sat there, just present for him for a while. I told his wife to love on him. And he said, I never knew I had trauma. He said, I never knew my life was traumatic. He was so sad. And he said, I don't want to talk about my, I don't want to talk about my past. It's the past. He said, I always just thought I had it rough. And, you know, he was just, he was just, he was just so sad. And it's like, I can see this little 12 year old boy just so sad and then i just you know and then i just realized and i helped them understand in that moment that even though they're having trouble they're struggling with their 14 year old daughter it's because they're getting stressed a part of it not all of it a part of it is because they're getting stressed out too and they're regressing into their adolescent brains where all their trauma is and then they're constricting into control dad tries to control mom shuts down and then of course the teenager acts out Number two, you got to understand your own challenges as an adolescent, which is so interesting because when I was an adolescent, 
when I was a teenager, that's actually when things started getting better between my mom and my dad, with, with me and my relationship with my mom and my dad. So, like, I, like, from, from birth to up to, like, 10 or 11, you know, it was all the spanking, it was all the yelling and stuff like that. But when I became a teenager, things got a lot easier, not easier, but a lot more Relax, and I'm not sure. I think it had to do with more along the facts that they were very parentified as as kids growing up. So when I finally hit the teenage years, it it's like it it allowed them to relax a little bit more, um, and things got a lot got a lot easier in our relationship. I know I was probably. 10 years old, I think, was probably the last time my dad ever whipped me. And then by the time I was 16, you know, he was, he was, he, he, I don't know what it was. I remember, I remember one day me and my friend Patrick were driving, we had went, we were working. We were, we were some working country boys. We were out in the country and after we got through working out in the field, we were driving my dad's little yellow Toyota truck. And uh, we were, you know, fishtailing because we were on a dirt road and I lost control. And bam! I hit this corner post. Oh, God. It smashed in the front end of my dad's little truck. But it still drove and I felt so bad. But at the same time, I didn't, I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. Like I drove home, I parked the, I parked the truck, dropped Patrick off, parked the truck, went in and said, Dad, got something to show you. And he came out and my dad, you know, up till that point, my dad was, he was a tough dude. He didn't take no stuff. I can't imagine the ass whooping I would have got as a 10 year old. But as a 16 year old, I said, dad, I had something to show you. He walks out and I show him the truck and I said, you know, I lost control and, and hit a pole and he just shook his head and he just like, he just like said, damn. And I, he was so, he was so disappointed. He was so upset. And that actually made me feel worse. It made me feel worse. And it's probably why I still remember the story. But that was it. It's like nothing else happened. He didn't say you're going to have to work this off. It cost like $700 to get fixed. He didn't say you're going to have to pay for it. He didn't say any of that. Pretty much the only thing he said was, damn. And, you know, it's his little work truck too. And so for me... When it came to adolescence, you know, even though I struggled with my own depression, really, I think it was just deep, just deep rooted transition, depression and things like that. Um, my parental, my relationship with my parents was much better. And it's probably because, you know, there was such hell with my sister, but you've got to know your issues that you bring into your relationship. So I tell you that because I like my teenage years raising my kids was like nothing. I mean, it's like I never was never afraid of the teen years. You know, I, I even had a group home with, with teenage boys and treatment homes with teenage girls. And, you know, we had our challenges, but it was like not threatening and not overwhelming. And I think it's because I don't have any real anxiety around my teenage years, but so many of the parents that I've encountered just over the last, you know, last week or so, they have so much anxiety themselves. So you got to be willing to give up some control. You got to understand your issues. You got to understand your issues. And number three, just because they're 14, 13, 14, 15, and 16, you have to remember when they stress, they regress. They are not 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. They're oftentimes two year olds. Sometimes they're babies. Sometimes they're three, but they regress. And when you stress, you regress and you act from that age. You've got to meet your child's emotional age. Meet the emotional age. And when you meet the emotional age, you will help them go back and make up developmental deficits that they've not been able to make up. You go back and you support them developmentally, emotionally, and then that helps them move forward. The reason they stress and they regress is because they haven't cleaned up that early childhood stuff. And you gotta help them. But the only way you can help them is if you can stay present in the moment. The only way you can help them is if you don't get overwhelmed and, and tell them to stop acting like a child. Oh my gosh, the other day I was in a home, I was taking a kid out, and I swear before we could get out of the door, the mom hit this kid with like seven different little things. And she didn't realize, and she doesn't realize that she's the one 
driving his window of tolerance down. Teenage kids, kids with trauma, adopted teenage kids, teenage foster kids, they've got enough to deal with on their own. They got enough of their own trauma to deal with, much less us dumping our crap on them all the time, stressing them completely out, and then, and then acting like they're the bad ones. We do that because we're not aware of our own stuff. And then when we're not aware of, their, of our own stuff, we're not present to their emotional regression. Your teenager in the midst of their problems is not 13, 14, 15, 16. They're not. They are regressing. So then I had another one of my favorite moms. She texted me the other day. Had an incident. She found something in her kid's room. And she's like, oh my God, I'm, so one of them had gone over, so one, one of the, one that came, turned out to be the two sisters, they're both like 15 and 16, and uh, she texted me, she said, I just found a vape pen and in my daughter's room, and she said, I'm headed over there right now to get her, she's supposed to be spending the night with a friend, I'm headed over there to get her, get her right now, I'm going to give her hell, something like that was the text message I got. <laughs> I texted back. I said, nope. <laughs> I said, hey, I, for some reason, my my, my, my uh, comments aren't scrolling. Hey there, Carrie. Hey, Christy, fantastic. Hello, Sephora. Hey, Patrick Watson, what's up? And uh, Eugenia, wonderful. Hey, Amy. Shay, great, wonderful. Oh, my gosh, there's a lot of comments. Gosh. Um, hey, Angela. Um so she she texted me. I'm going over there. I'm gonna, and this was Saturday. She said, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna get her. I'm gonna give her hell." And my exact text was, "Nope, don't go over there. Turn around." And then I realized that there's probably about eight minutes had passed before I'd gotten the text message. And so so I texted her back. I said pull over and then i'm like i got a call so i called her so she's in her truck and i said pull over she couldn't even hear me the first time because it's a bad signal and so i called back and i said pull over she said i'm pulling over i'm trying to pull over and i said no you're not gonna go over there so she pulls over she says okay i said you're not gonna go over there you're gonna let her sit in that fear and anxiety and that shame of knowing that you're upset and knowing that she had disappointed you, but you're not gonna take that opportunity, that learning lesson away from her. You're gonna turn around and you're gonna go back home and you're gonna let her stay over there instead of bringing her home and making your evening hell. Think about this. How many times do we do this as parents? You know why we do it? Because we're stressed. And when we're stressed, our thinking is confused and distorted. And our short-term short memory is suppressed. We end up making evenings worse, making days worse, making our weekends worse. Here's what you do. You have them both come into your room. You show them the vape pen. And you tell them how disappointed you are in them. And then you just watch them. Well, watch them. See, when we calm ourselves down and we stay clear, we can see facial expressions, body language. We can hear tones of voices. We can watch the eyes. I said, and then you ask them where it came from. And so mom texts me the next day and she's like, oh my gosh, they ended up both telling on each other about a whole bunch of stuff. And oh my God, they were blaming one another. And so she's so upset. And I'm like, you know what? Just calm down. It's okay. She feels bad about herself. You're doing a great job as a parent. Settle down. See, here's what we don't do. We don't let our children, we don't give them the opportunity to feel shame. We don't give them the opportunity to feel their own anxiety. See, this is how they develop morals. This is how they develop their own code of ethics. By allowing them to feel a certain way, not making them feel a certain way. And see, if we keep getting upset with our teenagers and, and punishing them and consequencing them and, and losing relationship, what we end up doing is we end up becoming the threat. And when we become the threat, we take all the attention away from the issue, from the real issue. So we, we as parents 
keep taking away the learning opportunity for our children because our brain is telling us that we got to fix something or control something or suppress it or change it instead of trusting that love create a loving environment create a loving presence and just let that work itself out let your you maintain fear says fix it love says create a relationship and an environment to allow, to allow it to fix itself so many times you don't have to do anything you just have to be you can say to your child, I feel really sad and I feel really disappointed. And that can be the most powerful teaching tool that you can ever use for that thing. Because all of a sudden, if you start yelling and punishing, then they start looking at you as the threat and they forget about the thing. See, and that's where we go wrong. That's where our children end up not learning. So anyway, that's all, guys. Bit of Monday rant because I had a triple espresso before I had that last session I just did with a mom and a 14 year old and mom knows very clearly that her stuff is is getting triggered and this little girl oh my god this little 14 year old oh i just love her she she's just so verbal and she said and, and mom was it was in the session at mom's work in the office and mom says i don't know why you know you you fight me about things and you get in my face and the and the little girl first she said i wonder if i ever hit you when have i ever you know tried this because this is a kid who will fight but she hasn't ever physically assaulted this mom but she's fought at school and fought her, her uh, siblings and stuff and uh, she's mom said that's not what I'm meaning I'm just meaning fight and she said yeah I'm fighting I'm fighting for you to love me and I was like oh my god that's amazing I love it it's beautiful and, and so then I had to take a call for a, when another parent was dealing with something and so I came back and I said I want to just point this out she said I'm fighting for you to love me and I said, I want you to understand, I'm talking to a 14-year-old. You don't have to fight for love. You don't have to fight to be loved. You just have to come to understand that you are worth being loved. That you have a mom who wants to love you. That's your work. Your work is to come to a place and in, in, in a place of security in your own heart, in your own being that lets you know you are worthy of love. You don't have to fight for it because fear makes us do the exact opposite of what we should do. Your fear makes you try to fight for it. And in fighting for it, you're actually pushing your mom away because she gets triggered and she shuts down and she runs away. Oh, emotion, emotion, emotion. All beautiful, all beautiful stuff. I hope this is helpful for you guys. In any given, in any given situation, we always have two choices. We can continue to react from our old blueprints of stress, fear, and overwhelm. Those are blueprints. We have blueprints. And I said to the mom, I said, you know what? You want to have a relationship with this girl? And you don't even have the blueprints for the relationship you want to create. And she doesn't have blueprints for a relationship with you because her whole experience, this child has been in seven different placements. Her whole experience is that she's not good enough. She's going to get sent away. I said, right now, it's it's your child seven and, and everyone else zero. We, we're not, we don't want to lose. Mom, this, me and you, we, we want to be, we want to be seven and one. And the one be the last placement she ever has, the last home. And so we don't have to keep reacting from those old blueprints of stress, fear, and overwhelm. We can stop. We can slow down. We can take three to ten deep breaths and choose love. And I hope you will choose love. And I know it's not always easy. And when you can't, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up. Love yourself. I had to, say, I had to tell a mom today, 13-year-old. I told her, when you do good, go in the bathroom and say, hey, you did good. Good job. Because when you were growing up, you never, heard, you never had anyone tell you that. So you got to give it to yourself. Some of you need to give yourself that. You need to give yourself that you're doing a good job. Even when you screw up. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. That's how we get better. God bless you. Big Papa loves you. Have a fantastic evening. I'll see you tomorrow.